I'd like to take this moment to welcome you to our Anthropology 1150, or Introduction to Evolutionary Anthropology. My name is Tanya Mueller, and uh, I will be guiding you through um, this term. So we will uh, start with just a little bit of background information. Sometimes I devote a whole lecture to this. Uh, I'm not really so inclined to do that right now, so I want us to be able to start material this week. So um, just a little bit about myself. I was originally a biology major, went to Virginia Tech, thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, while doing an internship, had to put some two-day-old puppies to sleep and decided that veterinary medicine was not actually for me, that I was going to study monkeys. I decided this at a university that didn't have any anthropology classes. Uh, applied to the top five graduate programs in primatology, did not get into a single one of them. Um, spent some time working as a volunteer gibbon keeper at a sanctuary north of Los Angeles in Santa Clarita, California. Reapplied, got into UNM, did my graduate work here um, at UNM. Um, I'm a primatologist at heart, which means that I do a lot of my work with um, non-human primates, monkeys, apes, etc. Um, my dissertation research was done <clears throat> with these gals here on the right. Uh, these are captive savannah baboons that are in San Antonio, Texas. I've done some work with zoo animals. I've done some field work in both Southeast Asia, uh, predominantly Indonesia, um, and then also in Panama, um, and uh, have also then been teaching um, undergraduate anthropology classes since 2005. Um, one point I want to bring up before we jump into material is that I do have a disability. I have Tourette syndrome. That's a neuro, uh, neurological disorder that's characterized by motor or movement and vocal tics. You won't notice my movement ticks, my motor ticks, because we won't really have much face-to-face -face contact, but my vocal ticks do come out during my lectures. The two main ones are <clears throat> and <clears throat> and so you'll hear me do that in lectures. It's not, I'm not cold, I don't have a cold, I'm not uh, doing it to annoy you. It is just how my disability presents itself. I figure it's easier to get that out in the open before you start listening to uh, lectures so you understand what's going on. Um, the syllabus um, is pretty self-explanatory. A lot of what's included in it, of course, are policies, uh, university-required policies. Um, but uh, you will see the grading scheme in there. Exams are going to be worth about 60% of your grade. The other 40% will be weekly activities. So those weekly activities will occur most weeks, um, but not during exam weeks. They're not going to be anything that requires too much time and effort. It'll be mostly uh, you'll have uh, these lectures to go through. You'll have study guides associated with these lectures. Uh, and then you'll have uh, discussion threads and maybe one additional activity each week. So we will start out talking about and or introducing evolutionary anthropology. We'll start by defining what anthropology is as an entire discipline. We will then distinguish what's so special about evolutionary anthropology. We will talk about what makes humans so different from other animals, notably uh, other primates. And then we will talk about how evolutionary anthropologists learn what they know um, and how evolutionary anthropology is quote unquote done. Uh, so we'll start with this definition of anthropology. Now, some of you may have already taken uh, CNM 1101, um, the Introduction to Anthropology. Uh, that covers the field as a whole and explicitly talks about the each of the four subfields. Anthropology as a discipline is the study of the human species and its immediate ancestors. So we'll look at, at populations that are both living and extinct. We'll look at uh, human biology, we will cover aspects of culture um, in other subfields. Those might be the primary areas of focus, uh, including culture, language, etc. Uh, the four subfields of American anthropology are cultural anthropology, which looks at how humans instrumentally use culture to cope with uh, environmental variation, archaeological anthropology, which studies material remains, or basically the garbage, the things that people have discarded or thrown away, linguistic anthropology, which looks at language, um, both its structure and function, as well as kind of how it's used strategically, socially, and how it's changed over time, and then evolutionary anthropology which is sometimes also referred to as biological or physical anthropology. 
Now, evolutionary anthropology studies human biological evolution and human biocultural variation. So we have to recognize two key concepts here. One is that we are, as a species, the product of our evolutionary history, uh, the product of all of these biological changes that have brought humanity to its current form. That is, we are partially biologically determined. Um, much of our uh, physiology, our anatomy, our um, even some of our behavior is uh, kind of guided or molded or shaped or dictated by our biological evolution. Uh, now, anthropology is one field, biology being another, where we've got to confront this uh, belief in evolution or, or talk about this idea of quote-unquote belief in evolution. Um, evolutionary theory is the very crux of biology as a discipline. Um, but in the United States, evolutionary pe uh, theory is a point of contention, a point of conflict. Um, when we address evolution in the United States, there is a not so small number of people who uh, treat it as something that you can either believe or not believe in. Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson has stated that the great thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. And evolution is one of those scientific principles that holds true uh, regardless of where you stand religiously, philosophically, uh, or uh, in terms of quote-unquote belief. We in this course will pre present evolution as fact. Evolution has occurred. Um, there is evolution. There's evidence of evolution among other species uh, as well as among humans. We have evolved in the past. We are still currently evolving. Um, people will sometimes counter that evolution is quote-unquote just a theory. Um, our next to last slide will address this difference between scientific law and scientific theory, but theories in science are well supported, well founded, have thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of hours of, operation, of observation supporting them, and ultimately are powerful because they are able to generate predictions. So that use of, oh, it's just a theory um, equates theories with hypotheses, which are untested ideas of explanations of phenomenon. Um, and in terms of evolutionary theory, it is not an hypothesis. It is uh, well documented. It is well supported by uh, copious amounts of observation. So I, I like to get that out in the open in the beginning because people do have uh, kind of questions or um, inherent conflict, particularly if they've come up uh, been, or they've grown up in a super religious kind of household. Now, uh, Catholicism um, is actually uh, fairly accepting of evolution. Um, it's things like evangelical Christianity, Pentecostal, uh, Southern Baptist, etc., that are a little bit more close-minded about evolution. Um, our discussion thread this week will actually address this. It'll, it'll talk about this kind of interplay um, or this conflict between science and religion and just ask you to, to comment a little bit on it. And I, I've included some of my own personal experiences with this conflict between science and religion, having grown up um, on the East Coast in, in the South uh, in an area that's collectively referred to as the Bible Belt. So we are products of evolution. We are an evolved species. Now, does that mean biology dictates everything that we do? No, absolutely not. We are also, each of us, the product of our own life histories. Our life histories form through the interaction between our genetics and our environment over the entirety of our life course. Our life course goes from birth to death. So when we talk about the human life course, we're talking about everything, every kind of decision that humans have to make from the time they are born to the time they die. Now, when we talk about life histories, we're talking about the timing of key kind of biological events. And so we talk about uh, the role of evolutionary fitness. We talk about the role of um, kind of these decisions that uh, particularly impact mortality and fertility, which is how we define fitness, right? Fitness is being able to survive and then leave copies of yourself that survive and then leave copies of themselves, so on and so forth. But humans are, I mean, all animals are shaped by the environment. All species are shaped by the environment. We can see variation due to 
elevation. We can see variation due to latitude, uh, due to growing season, due to uh, prevalent temperatures, average temperatures, seasonality, etc. across a wide variety of species. Um, but humans take it a step further in that we strategically not only change with our environment, but we change our environment. Um, and we critically use culture as perhaps our first and foremost means of adaptation. That's something we've increased over the course of our own evolutionary history. So when we talk about this uh, influence, this biocultural influence on human evolution and, and human, both physical features and behavior, um, you know, this is no small matter. We, um, we have strategically kind of uh, changed the course of our own evolutionary history through conscious cultural changes that we have made. Um, so <clears throat> we will talk about how um, our cultural changes have then changed this course of human evolution. And at the end, we might even conjecture a little bit about where we might go from this point forward. Evolutionary anthropology is kind of a, an eclectic field. We cover all aspects of human biology. Um, so we work with both dead and living populations. Um, when we're talking about dead populations, we might be talking about fully human populations. Or we might be talking about fossil hominin populations. Hominins are our ancestors who lived after we diverged from African apes, but aren't uh, at what we call anatomically modern homo sapiens or humans. Um, so one key characteristic of early hominins is that they are characterized by this upright bipedal locomotion. We will talk about that this extensively through uh, the course of the semester, but bipedality is one of the hallmarks of when we note the shift in the fossil record from what we call hominids, which includes African apes like chimps and, uh, and gorillas and our common ancestors, but also includes hominin or, or distinguishes us then from hominins. Hominins are bipedal, hominids maybe bipedal or quadrupedal. You know, chimps can walk upright, but they're still, their, their uh, skeletal structure is organized quadrupedally. Now it's more upright than monkeys like baboons are, but not nearly as upright as humans are. We work with both living and dead or extinct primate populations. Primates are distinguished among mammals uh, in having grasping hands, stereoscopic, uh, three-dimensional and color vision, larger brains for body size, long periods of parental investment, and a really high degree of complex sociality. Also, some primates use tools. Um, some primates do things that we might think uh, should only be the purvey of, of humans. Um, so. A lot of the primate research uh, over the past 30 years or more um, has <clears throat> pinpointed some of the ways that we don't differ from other primates, but we are interested ultimately in, in both what we share with other primates, but also what makes us distinctly human. So through the course of the semester, we'll talk about both of these things. Uh, biological or evolutionary anthropologists work with human remains, both fossil and recent. This includes bones and teeth. Some people are like, ew, bones. Well, you know, we're not talking about decomposing bodies, though that is a, a branch of uh, evolutionary anthropology as well. I mean, if you're talking about forensic anthropology, you might be working with decomposing dead bodies. You might need to know rates of decay in different kinds of environments. You may be able to, or you may need to be able to do an autopsy and identify cause of death. Um, all of this does fall under this umbrella of evolutionary anthropology, but so do bones that have fossilized. Um, and so one criticism of, of this kind of work is that, well, how can you really tell things like behavior from bones? Well, there's actually a lot of inferences that we can make about uh, hominin and then human behavior on the basis of bones. We can look at rates of maturation on the basis of dental eruption, um, things like the age of weaning, things like the age of first birth. We can look at trauma um, and make inferences about cultural uh, structures that um, kind of allowed for or led to that trauma. We can look at repetitive use injuries and um, gain some insight into um, foraging patterns or subsistence kinds of activities. So working with bones and teeth gives us actually a lot of information. And then uh, evolutionary anthropologists study all aspects of human biology. This includes growth and development. We can look cross-culturally and identify, I don't know, maybe a bare minimum 
that we need in terms of vitamins and minerals for development, uh, as well as uh, what excess of uh, certain nutrients, vitamins, minerals, calories even, does to our growth and development. Uh, this allows us to identify things like secular trends or trends over time, um, and to identify how dietary differences impact childhood growth and development. Um, human uh, or evolutionary anthropologists study human genetics. Um, this can include things like uh, recent genetic adaptations, such as uh, lactose tolerance, which only appeared between about eight and 6,000 years ago. Um, it can also study waves of migrations of people. We can look at things like, uh, do we have a mitochondrial Eve uh, or a Y chromosome Adam? Um, how recently did we emerge out of Africa? Um, we can look at uh, people who are nomadic and gain some insights like the Roma um, or uh, the Wodabi or the Basari and the Kashki and gain some insights into their ancestry. A lot of times that we find one interesting uh, study relatively recently was that the oral traditions of some indigenous populations match up almost perfectly with their uh, DNA as studied through websites like 23andMe um, and Ancestry.com. So you know, we can get some really interesting um, a corroboration of uh, oral traditions, oral history, and uh, actual genetic changes or genetic patterns. We also study how culture influences biology. We've done some interesting things in, let's say, well, firstly, the past 10,000 years. Uh, 10,000, 11,000 years ago, we uh, have the advent of agriculture. We start to domesticate plants and animals. That dramatically changes our diet, which dramatically then changes our health and well-being. Uh, for example, we didn't really have cavities or dental caries before the advent of uh, domesticated grain. So this diet of corn, wheat, barley, etc. Um, contributes directly to dental health or, uh, or ill health. Um, other kinds of disorders, uh, anxiety and depression, they seem rampant today. Um, they are particularly prevalent among um, student populations, um, more so graduate students than undergrad um, or community college students, but it has to do with our anonymity and our lack of a social support system. I mean, you, you know, you kind of isolate yourselves only with people who are like you. Um, you. Maybe you don't have as much of a focus on family. You lose out on some of the people who might be able to pick up on early expressions of things like anxiety or depression. So, you know, really, really interesting ways. Um, the other thing with mental health disorders that we're getting more and more evidence supporting is that our diet contributes directly to mental health disorders through changing our gut microbiome uh, through changing the bacteria um, that we have prevalent in our gut. Um, a diet high on grains, for example, causes a proliferation of yeast. Um, yeast feeds on sugar when grains are metabolized, they're metabolized into sugars. Um, yeasts then influence the way we think about things. So sugar cravings are absolutely real, but it's not your stomach really that wants that sugar. It's not even your brain really that wants that sugar. It's the yeast that live in your intestines. So you know, really fascinating kind of understandings of the finer <clears throat> tuned ways that we regulate ourselves and, and how small changes like adding grains to our diet can lead to big biological responses like uh, uh, increasing prevalence of all sorts of mental health and mood disorders. So here are just some examples of the kinds of things that uh, evolutionary anthropologists might study. Here we're comparing skulls between humans, chimpanzees, orangutans, and macaques. And we note this uh, trend towards increasing brain size. The middle picture is a lovely spider monkey from South America. I don't know why it says Africa there. That is not, oh no, that the Africa comes from, I think, um, Maybe the slide below it. I'm not sure. Uh, spider monkeys are not African. I only just noticed that that was at the bottom of the slide. Uh, they're South American. Uh, just an example of um, extant living primates. Uh, on the right, we've got a haplotype study of mitochondrial DNA um, throughout uh, Asia, including Iran, the Caucasus Mountains, uh, India, Turkey, Europe, and, and unknown. The bottom left, we've got Homo floresiensis, or the Hobbit people, uh, who are an isolated human population we don't know exactly where to put them in terms of our evolutionary family tree, but they lived on the island of Flores up to about 12,000 years ago when a volcano uh, erupted. Though there's folklore among the Nagda of Flores that <clears throat> talks about the little people who lived in the mountains and 
hunted dwarf elephants until the Dutch came in the 1600s. Uh, the bottom middle, we've got the evolutionary relatedness of... Uh, <gasps> Max, you need to stay in there. I'm finishing recording. You're done? Okay, can you be quiet out here? Okay. The uh, bottom middle, we've got our evolutionary family tree of the genus Homo, including Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo naledi, Heidelbergensis, Archaic Homo sapiens, modern Homo sapiens, and these outgrowths like Homo floriensis. And then on the bottom right, we, uh, we have a clinic kind of setting <clears throat> in Africa where we're looking at disease rates, epidemiology, those sorts of things. So evolutionary anthropology uh, covers a wide variety of fields of study. All right, so our, our next big question is what makes humans so different from other animals? We will talk about the six steps of humanness, including bipedalism, non-honing chewing, particularly looking at our canine teeth, complex material culture and tool use, hunting, speech, and dependence on domesticated species. So here we have a gorilla in a zoo context. This is a western lowland gorilla. Um, on the right, we've got Australopithecus afarensis, or the... Uh, the species that uh, includes the well-known remains of an individual named Lucy. If you look at these two, you notice they move in a fundamentally different way. Um, the gorilla on the left is quadrupedal, has both hands and feet on the ground. Now their spine does start to be oriented upright. They're doing something, if you look at their hands, something that only great apes do, which is called knuckle walking, where they fold their long fingers under. Um, but you notice their arms are significantly longer than their legs. Their pelvis is uh, is kind of facing just straight front and back. Um, and their spine is going to come into the base of their skull, kind of at the back of the skull, so that when they're on all four legs, they can look straight ahead. Now compare that to Lucy. Lucy has a pelvis that is uh, rotated forward and up. This is directly related to bipedality, but also directly related to more difficult childbirth. We'll talk about that as the semester wears on. Lucy still has arms that are longer than her legs, but we're starting to see uh, arms that, uh, that will shorten over time. And if you would look at the base of the skull where the spinal column comes into the brain, you're going to see that it comes in at the base of the skull, the bottom of the skull. This opening, the hole through which the spinal column enters is called the foramen magnum. And so on bipedal skeletons, it's at the base of the skull. On quadrupedal skeletons, it's at the back of the skull. This bipedality has incredible implications for brain development, for social structures, for the development of tool use and culture, etc. We're not going to talk about all the details of it with this first week. We're just introducing this as one of the ways that we are distinguished from other primates and other mammals. The second is our non-honing canines or non-honing chewing. If you look at the baboon on the left, you notice that their canines are huge. Not only that, but they have a gap between their canines and adjacent teeth. Um, on the top jaw, that gap is between the incisors and the canine. On the bottom jaw, that gap is both there, but also between uh, the canines and the premolars. This space is called a diastema. Um, and what this does is basically moves teeth out of the way so that this really long canine that is honed to a sharp point um, has space to go when the mouth is closed. Um, we don't have this. If you look at the human teeth in the picture on the right, we really don't even have much structural difference between our incisors or our kind of four central teeth and our canines. We don't have what are called caniniform canines or those that are really pointy. We're not vampires, in other words. Um, instead, we have canines that are very what we call incisiform, uh, which means that they're shaped more like incisors than they are like fangs or actual canines. Why don't we have honing chewing? Well, because we developed tools <clears throat> and culture to relax the uh, the pressures of chewing, to relax the selection pressures on thick teeth, thick jaws, robust musculature associated with chewing. What do we do instead? Well, 
we butcher things. We cut our meat. We don't have to tear flesh right off the bone. Um, we slice through skins to get to the meat below. Um, we pound things like sweet potatoes or, uh, or other kinds of root crops to make them softer to release their natural juices. Most importantly, we cook things. What cooking does is um, starts to break down um, this, particularly the cell walls in plants. Um, animal cells don't have cell walls; they just have cell membranes. But it, it, in animal tissue, it breaks down a lot of the tough connective tissue. So by cooking our food, we are pre-digesting it. We are relaxing kind of the the uh, mechanical demands that eating really has. Here we see tool use. Now on the left, we've got a capuchin monkey in South America that's using rocks to crack open nuts. Chimpanzees also do this. So there are certainly isolated cases of tool use among um, a couple species of non-human primates. Um, these are phenomenal. We love to study primates using tools. Um, chimpanzees and capuchins right now are both innovating new tools. Capuchins have now been observed using shovels, using stone shovels to dig up roots and tubers. This is amazing and gives us insight into our own evolutionary history as well. Chimpanzees, over the past 10 years, females have started to take sticks and sharpen them to a point and go around to sleeping nests of bush babies, which are a nocturnal <laughs> prosimian in Africa <clears throat> and they they skewer bush babies while they're sleeping. Um, this isn't really hunting because there's no pursuit of prey. Um, this is more of what we would call extractive foraging because all they have to do is know where it is and then extract it from its environment. But fascinating, only observed in the past 10 years, never observed prior to that point. This behavior is starting to spread now to uh, adolescent males who will then carry that forward into adulthood. So we have primate examples right now where we're observing new cultural traits emerge and this is super exciting for evolutionary anthropologists because it gives us some insight into how human culture may have emerged and spread. But look at the stones that Capuchin's using compared to the stones from a site in the Middle East on the right. The capuchin is using those stones as those stones occur in the environment. So there's no modification. There's no looking at a rock and thinking, hmm, what could I make that into? Human tools are much more modified. We look at a rock and we don't think this rock is hard. If I smash this rock, it will break whatever I'm trying to open. We think, what could I turn that rock into? And sometimes that becomes an arrowhead or a spear point. And sometimes that becomes Michelangelo's David. So, you know, this kind of abstract representation, we can turn a rock into almost anything. And that's exciting and phenomenal and incredibly uh, adaptive over the long run. <coughs> Here we show some slides of hunting. Chimpanzees actively hunt, cooperatively hunt, specifically species like red colobus monkeys. And not only that, but they share the meat according to specific cultural rules after the hunt is over. So in a cooperative hunt of red colobus monkeys, male chimpanzees will each fill a different role. There will be some that climb trees unseen so that they'll be able to jump out and flush the animals out of wherever they're settled. There are some that climb trees visible to uh, cut off roots of escape. There's going to be the male that strikes the killing blow, etc. Um, after the hunt is over, the males that participated in the hunt will all get a share of the meat, though the male that did the killing blow will get the largest share. Um, they may also share meat with males that are alliance partners but did not partake in the hunt, and they may share meat with uh, females who are showing signs of estrus or, or who are just good friends. Compare that to the Hadza on the right. The chimpanzees are hunting without the use of tools. The Hadza on the right definitely hunting with the use of tools. Chimpanzees go for animals that are smaller than them. Red colobus monkeys, baby baboons, impala, etc. The Hadza go for large game, like elephants and uh, giraffes. So how do we do that without getting killed as humans? Well, through this use of tools. Not only that, 
but human populations share their food incredibly widely, even with people that will never partake in a hunt with them, even with people who might live in other communities. So the degree of sophistication, both of the skills and technology involved in hunting, and also the cultural rules involving uh, the distribution of food after hunting are elaborated greatly among human populations. This use of language. The picture on the left has Sue Savage Rumball with Kanzi, uh, who is the bonobo sitting right uh, next to her. Um, and I believe the one next to him is Pan Benicia um, <clears throat> and a, a lexagram board in front of them. They have papers that have 384 non-iconic arbitrary symbols. So what this means is that there is a symbol on that page that would stand for apple. It is not a picture of an apple. Um, there is a symbol on that page that stands for go outside, that stands for put on the collar, which is what they have to wear to be able to go outside, that stands for the A-frame, which is a particular structure in the woods uh, in the reserve that surrounds the research institute. These bonobos have quote-unquote language when they are given a form that they can use through these learning these lexigrams. The problem is they don't have this form in nature, right? We don't observe bonobos um, drawing pictures for each other to communicate ideas. So um, what does this indicate to us? Well, it indicates that perhaps the cognition associated with language is present even in some of our last common ancestors, but that speech itself is a relatively new or young phenomenon. And so, you know, the text will talk about things like the hyoid bone that evolved about or changed about two and a half million years ago. That is certainly one component of it. There's also a certain genetic mutation called the FOXP2 gene. When humans have the chimp version, which is the primitive version, they slur their words. They don't have the fine muscle control, fine motor control of the muscles that move the, song, the tongue, so they can't enunciate. So, you know, language or speech is not like one gene, one trait kind of thing. We didn't see one gene change or one morphological feature change that then enabled us to stand up like Obama and give speeches to people from across the world. No, um, rather it's the accumulation of a, a number of both genetic and, and kind of behavioral and morphological changes that have led to the use of human speech itself. But speech is absolutely a huge advantage. We can communicate a lot more information. I mean, heck, you don't even have to look at me to learn material from this class. That's really amazing, right? That I can tell you things that maybe I haven't even directly experienced. You know, how do I know what's going on in this picture with Sue Savage Rumble? I've never been to uh, what used to be in uh, Georgia and then in Iowa, right? I've never worked with her bonobos. So our use of language has allowed us to vastly kind of elaborate and increase the complexity of what we're able to learn and pass on. <clears throat> and then we have our reliance on domesticated crops and kind of this change we've made with food. On the left, we have a mountain gorilla who's eating bamboo. Now, they don't only eat bamboo. They eat wild celery. They eat wild cucumbers. They will eat some fruits, um, though uh, chimpanzees also live in their area and specialize on fruits, so there's not a lot of fruit available for gorillas. Um, but compare that to the just the dietary diversity present in this one street market, food market from Seoul, South Korea. Right? What do we see there? We see a, a vast array of meats, of vegetables, of uh, flatbreads made from domesticated crops. We see vermicelli there, which are rice-based noodles, hot peppers, ginger, mushrooms. I mean, just the incredible culinary diversity that we have created through switching over to agriculture is mind-boggling. 